Through the history of comic books, we've seen superheroes become created in the Golden Age, where just about anything could happen. Then we saw the Silver Age, where they gained more internal conflict. Things started getting really dark in the Bronze Age in the 1970s, going into the 1980s. And after the 1980s, things are going to get very dark, which we'll talk about why this is often called the Dark Age. Uh, other people call it a modern age of comics, uh, just because this is when they started doing real scholarship on comics, and so that was the modern era. Although, as we'll see, it's ironically postmodern. And some folks also call it the Diamond Age of Comics. Uh, this is not only just keeping going with those precious metals. We had uh, gold, silver, bronze, and so what's next? Diamond. Uh, but it also ties in with diamond distributors. So during the 1970s and 80s, we had this big growth of the comic book shop as an industry. And as part of those shops, they need distributors. And so the diamond company out of New Jersey came and organized all of this and kind of strong-armed some people and, and made it into, if you want to get your comic into shops on a wide basis, you got to work through them. So you can call it whichever you like, uh, but there's no perfect name for it. And some people, as we'll talk about, say we're still in this era, uh, although I would disagree. I think we've uh, shifted gears since the early 2000s. We're going to get the Dark Age started in 1986 with The Dark Knight Returns. So Frank Miller had been working on some indie projects, uh, doing very manga-inspired things in the 1970s. He came in to work for Marvel to revamp Daredevil into a much darker uh, character, and the darkness really t stuck with the spirit of the times, and so DC brought him in to do something new with Batman. Uh, Batman started off as you know a pretty uh, violent, uh, dark character working from the night, this opposite of Superman. Uh, but through the Silver and Bronze Age, uh, it got to the point where he was teaming up with Scooby-Doo and going to solve mysteries where villains you know, fell into giant pies, and that was the end. So Frank Miller gave it a very different direction. He thought, you know, if this is a guy who saw his parents killed in front of him as kids and now dresses up in a costume and goes and beats people up, like, he's, he's got some serious problems. So here we see Batman uh, really torn up, uh, not the shiny Batman you'd see from the 1960s, but somebody who has been working out nonstop for the last 40 years uh, because he saw his parents killed in front of him. So this is our first postmodern look at a superhero. We question ourselves, well, what are these basic tenets of being a superhero? And when we start looking at the pieces of it, uh, really, it's kind of crazy. Frank Miller gives us not only a reevaluation of the character, uh, but also this interesting post-apocalyptic setting, this kind of dystopia where uh, Gotham City fell back into evil once Batman was forced to retire, and so now Batman has to come out of retirement and overthrow this gang of mutants. And we see the Batmobile not as a fancy car that can go fast, but a full-on tank shooting rubber bullets and explosives. So a very dark new perspective on Batman, which a lot of people at the time did not like and rebelled against, uh, but other people liked it quite a bit. Which, of course, disagreement between comics fans is things we'll always have, and we can see those in movies as well, uh, with Ben Affleck playing Batman, and many people saying, oh, he's too dark and evil and so forth. Uh, but looking at the introduction of the Batman in scenes from the DC movie Batman vs. Superman, a lot of the shots are taken panel for panel from The Dark Knight Returns, such as when he tackles a guy through the wall. And of course, this would have been the comics that young Ben Affleck would have been reading in the 1980s. So really, his Batman is his Batman. You just have to pick your own. During this time, we had the original Robin, Dick Grayson, spin off and go work with the Teen Titans. Um, there were, you know, some uh, good bits of dialogue and uh, some tension built between Batman and Robin as uh, Robin comes into his own. Uh, so for a while, Batman was working by himself, but uh, he did need a sidekick and met Jason Todd, this uh, kind of street kid whose uh, mother is presumed dead and missing, and uh, his father is leading in into a life of crime. And so Batman rescues him and turns him into another Robin. But uh, he wasn't very popular. Uh, he, he was always questioning Batman. It, it really pressed the tension between the two. So such as, you know, why are we locking up the Joker, he's just going to escape again. Why don't we shoot him and end, end this? And and Batman says, no, that's going to lower us to his level. We can't do that. And Jason Todd just, just won't buy into it. Uh, so not terribly popular, uh, to the point that DC decided to try an experiment, and they ended a comic where the Joker had pinned Robin 2 
in a warehouse and set a bomb, and the last page was Batman running in to see if he could rescue him, and they left it up to the fans. Uh, they produced two different issues, and they were going to publish the one that got the most votes. So one of the first ever uh, one nine hundred number to call in with your vote, whether you wanted Robin to live or die. And by a narrow margin, the public voted for Robin to die. And so we lost Robin too. But of course, we'd soon get other Robins uh, down the road. But this is this darker time where it's not just you know Spider-Man's girlfriend dying or, or a connection, but actually he's the superhero himself. And people really like this, so we'll revisit this death throughout this era, which is why many people call it dark. DC began another experiment, uh, bringing in Alan Moore, who had already revamped characters such as Swamp Thing, and they needed to redo a lot of these characters that they had brought over from Charleston Comics, uh, which was another comic company that had gone defunct and DC had scooped up their heroes. So they handed him to Alan Moore to recreate them, uh, but by the point that Moore was doing this postmodern examination of uh, what makes these heroes tick, uh, we got something completely different with the Watchmen. So instead, uh, those heroes were handed off to other folks, and we got original heroes in this uh, kind of parallel universe, what many people might call a graphic novel. So we had heroes such as Captain Atom, uh, who has these atomic powers, but instead Dr. Manhattan. Uh, Blue Beetle became Night Owl. Uh, the Question became Rorschach. In Alan Moore's Watchmen, we got a very different look at what it means to be a superhero. Just looking at this and starting from the left, we have Ozymandias, the smartest man in the world, this uh, inventor hero who uses self-discipline to make himself as powerful as possible, uh, spun off and made his own company, because why wouldn't you? And uh, uses uh, nefarious kind of utilitarian ideas. We have the girl hero, Silk Spectre 2, who in this comic is uh, officially used as just kind of a connection point um, with Dr. Manhattan. So she's just there to give the other characters something to do, which they examine and she rebels against in the comic itself. Uh, we have Night Owl, who in this timeline, superheroes are outlawed in the 1970s, and being a very lawful good character, uh, it's against the law, so he just retires and becomes not a superhero anymore, uh, which over the course of his arc, he gets back into superheroing. And then of course we have the objectivist superhero, Rorschach, who has a very tragic storyline of just going insane. Uh, they did this very well in the comic as well as the movie, in which uh, he was tracking down this serial killer who was picking up kids and, and they were disappearing, and finds him where he had killed the kid and uh, had his dogs eat her to get rid of her. And so the guy merely gives up and says, Oh, you caught me. I'm going to go to jail and probably get a book deal. And Rorschach just loses it because that's not justice. That's not it. So he decides that he's going to give him a test. And so he chains him to the furnace in the building and sets it on fire and gives him a hacksaw saying, if you're really sorry, you know, you, you cut your hand off and walk out. And so uh, Rorschach leaves him to this test and the guy uh, ends in those panels uh, screaming, saying, you can't do this. This isn't right. And Rorschach says, you know, what is right? In the foreground, we have the comedian, the older superhero. Started out as a sidekick uh, there in the 50s and worked his way up to becoming a real hero in his own right, uh, who, as the comedian, you know, had kind of jokey uh, Dick Grayson-style lines, but over the course of PTSD and seeing all these heroes and fighting people and going to Vietnam, uh, finds out that nothing's funny. It's all a joke. It's just not funny. And in the back, we have Dr. Manhattan, the only one with actual powers. And through the course of the comic, we see, you know, what if you did legitimately have superpowers? Uh, he has the ability to change matter at will, which does put him on another level of human beings. So at one point, Ozymandias, you know, says, I'm the world's smartest man. And Dr. Manhattan says, to me, that's like saying you're the world's smartest termite. You know, it, it just doesn't matter. Uh, which we see illustrated through the course of the comic uh, by Dr. Manhattan wearing less and less clothes. So which reasons you wear clothes? Number one, uh, you got to stay warm or keep the rain off. Uh, and number two, modesty, because nobody wants to see all that stuff. So since he can change matter, uh, being, staying warm doesn't matter to him. He can do whatever he wants with that. Uh, so the only reason he's wearing clothes is out of concern for other people around him, which as the comic progresses, uh, he starts caring less and less and less, because why should he? We're just termites to him. 
Also in this dark age, we see indie comics becoming mainstream. Uh, most famously, of course, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So in 1984, they got started specifically as indie comics. Uh, they were Eastman and Laird, a couple of art guys, uh, who borrowed Eastman's uncle's tax rebate for a few months to do a print run of this comic they created, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which completely ridiculous. You know, ninjas are known for being speedy and, and expert, and turtles are not... And it was hilarious. And it was a little one-shot thing about these turtles being raised up by a rat and going and killing Shredder. Now he dies in the first issue. Uh, Self-contained, but people really loved it. And they started asking, you know, when's issue two coming out? And Eastman said, we're working on it. So they did. And uh, they sold in comic book shops and conventions and built an entire industry around it. Uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are worth you know over a billion dollars now today. And that got started through this age of these independent comics uh, becoming mainstream, with uh, people loving comics and all these cons and shops opening up. Uh, there's a huge market for people who weren't part of DC or Marvel to make something new. So we got Mirage Studios, which Eastman and Laird started up in their apartment, and they called it Mirage because it was just their apartment, uh, but eventually would become a full uh, office the size of a warehouse. Another independent comic from New England Comics, The Tick, uh, who was created specifically as a mascot for the New England Comics Convention, has produced dozens and dozens of issues and several TV series, uh, most recently on Amazon, and it's all about a legitimately insane superhero. Uh, he's bored. He, this opening splash page shows him sitting in an insane asylum, saying that he's only been here for two months and I'm already bored. No unnecessary sedation, no electroshock therapy, not even elevator music. This feels confined, restrained. I will leave this place. And goes on to be a hero in the city where we see lots of lampooning of superheroes, such as the Crusading Chameleon, whose ability is that he can change into camouflage and it changes colors. Uh, although his super weakness is plaid, if he ever tries to turn plaid, it, it causes his brain to spark out. So we get this really interesting uh postmodern look at superheroes being actually crazy individuals dressing up in costumes with powers that may or may not be practical for actual world use. Another thing that started out as a joke, and I suppose continues as a joke, though, though a very good one, is the introduction of Deadpool. Uh, DC had its very popular Deathstroke character, this mercenary who had special powers. In parody of him, uh, Marvel introduced Deadpool, this character who, arguably legitimately insane, uh, often refers to himself being in a comic, so whether it's breaking the fourth wall or he has mental illness, most likely the former. But uh, he has swords and runs around and shoots bad guys and uh, arguably an anti-hero, but he makes so many jokes with it that it's cute and funny and has produced several good films off of it. So here's the image of the original from DC. And the thing that started as a parody and now of course has totally eclipsed what has come on. Much like Alan Moore was brought in to recreate superheroes, we had Neil Gaiman brought in to redo the Golden Age hero Sandman, who was this superhero who'd go around with a gas gun that would put people to sleep. Uh, but instead of just recreating a new hero, Neil Gaiman took the comic in a completely different direction, this fantastical embodiment of the dreamscape. So this raised comics onto a whole new level. Uh, it's not just an adventure a week where he's going out and trying to beat a bad guy, uh, but it's actually an examination of the experience of reality. It includes numerous characters, uh, such as his sister Death, uh, who... Uh, isn't necessarily seen as a negative, but, but the passing on that needs to happen for life to mean something. Uh, and even Shakespeare, uh, who is inspired by the Sandman to create these amazing plays, but three of them have to be made in his honor. And we get an entire storyline of how do you appease somebody that's arguably even above a god. It's just a, a power force of the universe. Many fans were enjoying these experiments in postmodernism, but for the most part, uh, comics were starting to crash. They had a big uh, explosion there in the 1970s and 80s, uh, but once again, it's coming on a downward stream as people are going on to different things. So in 1993, 
DC needed something to really grab people's attention. And so they decided, well, uh, killing Robin was pretty shocking, so let's kill Superman. So we had the Death of Superman storyline. They created Doomsday, this unbeatable villain. He'd been created to defeat anyone, and so of course he goes up against Superman himself, and Superman uh, punches and punches and punches until finally uh, he defeats Doomsday. And we get this splash page here of Superman bleeding out to death. And Lois Lane is saying, hold on, you know, the paramedics will be here any second, but of course what can paramedics do with uh, needles that can't penetrate Kryptonian skin? And of course Superman, is his last thoughts is, did I save you? Are you okay? Doomsday, is he gone? And, and Lois Lane comforts him and says, yes, he is. And, and we get Superman, who for a long time, you know, people had kind of lost interest because he's unstoppable. How, how do you make something like that interesting? Well, you stop him. And with this death, uh, shocked everyone. Uh, it became international news. Everyone was blown away. But we do have an issue of Superman making a lot of money, and you want to keep that money rolling. So they replaced him. We had the War of the Supermen. These four characters come on, such as Last Son of Krypton and the Man of Steel. And they fight out for a little while, but of course Superman himself comes back uh, because nobody can really die in comics except for Gwen Stacy, which a lot of people were disappointed in because it doesn't mean anything if somebody dies and then comes back. Uh, even Jason Todd had disappeared for years, but he's back now. And unfortunately, in the comics industry itself, that's what you have to do. You can't just kill off your intellectual property. Uh, and since that time, everybody's died. Uh, Wonder Woman's been killed uh, over and over again, uh, which even led into the Blackest Night series of Green Lantern comics in which everyone who had died came back now as a villain. And so they had to fight pretty much everyone all the time. Um, and unfortunately, rather than seeing that deeper literary level like we had with Sandman and Watchmen, uh, on the mainstream going into more just gimmicks. So such as the famous DC vs. Marvel comics. Both publishers, of course, were struggling trying to get new readers in, so they decided, and we did so well with Secret Wars, having people fight people, so let's just have both sides fight. So it's a short series where Superman fights Hulk and Aquaman fights Namor and everyone's kind of paired up and ultimately decides that no one's the true victor. It's, it's just the readership that is the real winner of, of coming together. Which led us into another kind of gimmicky thing, the short run Amalgam Comics. They took these characters who were merged out of two of uh, DC and Marvel into something new such as Super Soldier, this uh, Captain America and Superman blended character, or Dark Claw, uh, Wolverine and Batman blended, which uh, led into a lot of really cool sales and gimmicks things, but once again, it's a gimmick, so it'll only sail for a short time. Meanwhile, other indie comics were coming up very strong, such as Image, uh, Robert Layfield, uh, and several others who we had seen create things like uh, Deadpool, were fairly upset with how the industry was working with its artists, just as Jack Kirby had been in the Bronze Age. And they decided, well, with distributors, we know all the folks to talk to. We don't need a publisher. We can just become our own. So they came together and published Image Comics and created heroes such as Spawn, this very dark character. Uh, starts with the main character dying. Uh, he's a mercenary, clearly a bad guy, and ends up going to hell. But he makes a deal with the devil. Uh, he just wants to come back and see his family. And the devil says, okay, well, you'll be my mercenary and I'll give you a power suit. And as soon as the power runs out, you'll be back. But of course, never make a deal with the devil because you don't know what he's going to pull strings on. And so he does. He sends him back. But by that point, it's been six months and his corpse is partially rotten. So he's really stinky. And the only people who will be around him are hobos. And uh, his wife has already moved on. So he can't really get back into her life without ruining it and it's just really dark and a uh, fun perspective that you would never see in the mainstream because they can't go that dark uh, or savage dragon by eric larson so you see a superhero uh alien from another world coming to earth and becoming a cop because that's what you would do uh, those are the folks who stop crime and so we see indie comics not just working on a smaller scale, but thanks to distributors like Diamond working on a huge scale nationally. And Image to this day is rivaling Marvel and DC, uh, just like other publishing houses like Dark Horse. 
Through the 90s, DC will experiment with more literature and gimmicks, uh, such as Elseworlds. We have our Kingdom Come, which is, you know, two generations down the road, what happens to these superheroes. And we get a world where uh, being a superhero is more about the popularity than anything. And so we have heroes who are actually busting villains out of jail so that they can go catch them again. Uh, and we have our original heroes come back and, and see what we can do to set things right. Which works on not only a literary level, uh, but then also this kind of gimmick of, well, what's Superman going to be like when he's you know, 80 years down the road? As I'd mentioned before, a lot of people say that we're still in this era, although I would argue that we have gone into what I like to call the digital age. Since about 2000, comics have really been changing up. Uh, we've got this higher literary level uh, being produced on a wide variety of genres, uh, such as DC's Vertigo line uh, doing these graphic novels uh, with Why the Last Man, which is a story about uh, all the males in the world disappearing at once, except for this main character and his rhesus monkey. And it leads into a whole experiment of, you know, what what is the world like without guys in them? Uh, and on the one hand, it's dystopian, but on the other hand, it's uh, a lot of pieces broken out, and it explores things that you wouldn't see in an everyday comic, because who's the supervillain? And, and there isn't one. It's just uh, basically a novel in comic form. Much as we'll see with comics like The Walking Dead, where it's not necessarily the zombies who are The Walking Dead, it's the people. Uh, the world is peaked, it's over, and, and uh, nobody trusts anyone, and it's all about survival. But if you're already gone, what does it matter? So this is this newer era where we have to get into literature because people aren't just buying the same superheroes over again. There are superheroes, such as Image continuing its Invincible line, which is kind of a son of Superman story. And this uh, teen whose dad is the superhero in the world uh, has to take up the mantle when his dad disappears. It starts off as a fun superhero story, but then as they explore what does it mean to be a hero and what do you mean about collateral damage and all these things that you don't really think about on a, a regular superhero basis, but once you get into it, uh, it is very interesting. Also indicative of this era are the big cross-title events, so which Marvel got started in 2004 and 5 and 6 with Civil War. It started with an event of some superheroes tracking down supervillains, and they have this big fight outside of a, an elementary school, which ends up killing a bunch of kids. And so there's a Superhero Registration Act movement goes in, and it uh, causes a big rift. And it's one thing that affected everybody. So not just the Civil War comics itself, but also individual comics. This is showing that it happened all over the Marvel Universe. And like, well, what's Spider-Man's reaction to it? What's Luke Cage's reaction to it? What are the X-Men's reaction to it? And we get into this deep question of where do you draw the line between freedom and security, which had been asked you know, since 9-11. And we have Captain America on the one hand saying, well, no, you don't put people's names on lists. We're doing good things. You just got to trust us. And people do bad things. We're going to stop them. And then on the other side, you have Iron Man who's saying, no, we need organization to this. Otherwise, more people are going to get hurt as we see through here. And people did get hurt. They ended up killing Captain America, uh, but of course nobody stays dead in comics, so he came back. Uh, and it addressed really good political questions and got a lot of attention. So Marvel continued having these big cross-title events over and over again. DC tried to do very similar things with uh, stuff like Final Crisis, where Batman gets killed. But of course it's comics, so he comes back. He in fact was hit with a time bullet, so he was bounced back into history and had to work his way back to the present. And following that, they decided, okay, well, with this convolution, we just need to get things rebooted. So they did Flashpoint, where the Flash ran so fast that he broke the universe, and that led into this new 52. We've got new generations coming in, so we need to reintroduce our heroes to them. And they launched 52 titles, each with different heroes and villains and a couple of different universes, showing all what could be interesting. It was a very clever publishing move because they could see which titles were popular and then thin out the ones that didn't work so well, and also gave room to new creations such as Harley Quinn. She'd gotten started in the animated series of Batman in the 90s, and by this time she was so popular that uh, she got her own comic series, uh, which has done very well. With the problem of 
kind of the surge of attention at the reboot, uh, DC and Marvel have just been kind of rebooting over and over and over again. Uh, we had Convergence, in which, in which once again the universe got broken and was reborn with literal DC rebirth. On the Marvel side, they did something very similar. So they brought back Secret Wars from the 1980s, which did pretty well, threw all these heroes together to fight each other, and then did their own rebirth with uh, different lines, such as Marvel Legacy, which will keep the heroes going that people know and love, as well as introducing the all-new, all-different Marvel with uh, new heroes, such, such as the girl Iron Man, uh, or the daughter of Wolverine, uh, or Ms. Marvel, and nobody more popular than Spider-Gwen. So we're in a strange place in comics these days. Uh, everybody is getting so much media all the time through social media that they don't need to go out and buy comics like you would have in the 1940s. But we also have these really popular superhero movies coming out, which rely on the comics to get ideas for the storylines and where these characters have come from and see who's popular and who's not. Marvel and DC are in a very interesting position, owning all of these very popular characters who have you know, almost a century of history to them, but then they're also under constant threat of those characters growing stale and other publishers coming in with new creations and stories that aren't just superheroes. See so a wide variety of genres coming in today, especially among middle grade and young adult readers. We'll just have to see what the next century of comics has to hold for us.